it says 12? Sure. Okay. All right. Um, we'll just go with John since you're sitting with the first okay. thing. All right, John. Infrahyla region. Yeah. Um, well circumscribed, has good borders. It not a definite border here on this side, so I believe it's confluent with the vasculature potentially of the hyla region or there's on this radiograph it appears to the medial overlay. yeah. So uh, well, a good way to say that would be that along the medial aspect the uh, mass is inseparable from the vessels, right? The truth of the matter is that the hyalur, hyalur overlay sign is positive here. See, okay. look at this. This is a vessel. This is one branch and this is another branch. So the hyalur overlay sign is positive, telling you that this is not a vascular lesion. Correct? If the hyalur overlay sign, if this lesion was vascular, then this branching should not go through it. It should be a part of the branching process. Okay, all right. So the hyalur overlay sign is positive. There's a right infrahyalur region mass lesion. What about the lateral? Well, circumscribed over lesion. All right. Differential diagnosis, please. Um, so it could be a. Right now, it's you know it's a wide open field. I haven't shown you a CT. I haven't given you any history. So you're going to start with lymph node, AVM, you know things like that. Since you know um, uh, so it's wide open right now. A central mass, yeah. right? Okay. All right. Let me show you. Uh, okay. So, actual contrast in ACT shows a well circumscribed lesion in the uh, looks like the right middle lobe region. Uh, it contains high and low density components. Uh, this looks to be a fat density here. Macroscopic fat, yes. Macroscopic fat. So. That, makes me believe more it's a uh, pulmonary hematoma. Very good. So this was a solitary pulmonary nodule. And uh, again, this is just a broad-based differential diagnosis. It was infection, could be bacterial, could be granulomatous, could be a neoplasm, benign malignant, could be an AVM, an infarct, a cyst, a mucoid impaction, or trauma hematoma. Again, and this is, you're right, this is a fatty tumor denuation. This was a hamartoma. So what is an SPN? It's a solitary pulmonary nodule three centimeters or less. And SPM, which is solitary pulmonary mass, is above three centimeters. So N below three, M above three. Less than 5% of benign pulmonary nodules are more than three centimeters in size. So this mass and nodule is based on this, that less than 5% of benign nodules are more than three centimeters in size. So that is to do with the doubling time, 1.25, um, at least in two dimensions. So a doubling time is measured when there is increase in 1.25 inches on at least two dimensions. Then 1.25 times uh, or inches in two dimensions and then you can call that this has doubled. Another way to put it is that it's not, it's 33% of the mass. If the mass increases in volume by 33%, it is doubled. It doesn't have to increase by 50%. Does that make sense? Because it's a voluminous data. Increase by 33% or 1.25 inches. All right. Looking at uh, just solitary pulmonary nodules very basically. So this lesion is marginal lobulation. As you can see, there is gentle lob there's broad lobulation and gentle lobulation. This is corona radiata or marginal speculation. Just remember that when you see lobulated margins and speculated margins, you know it's probably malignant, but smooth margins are indeterminate. It means nothing. It could be METs, it could be benign. Benign calcifications could be central, could be laminated, could be popcorn or diffuse. And this is an example of not benign calcification. What are not benign? Powder-like or amorphous, peripheral, 
multiple punctate calcifications or stippled. Stippled means broken. This is yet another pulmonary nodule that is demonstrating central cavitation. And this is a feeding vessel sign. What is a feeding vessel sign, John, since this is still your case? Uh, where you can see a vessel leading to the, the nodule or a mass? Yes, like what does it imply? Applies a vascular supply to the mass, uh, so vascular recruitment. Um, so you could either have <clears throat> some sort of vascular abnormality, or leads you more to think it's possibly malignant. Correct. So remember that feeding vessel sign may well be seen in infarcts because the vessel is leading up to it where it's infarcted, and just beyond the infarcted vessel, you can see that. So while it can be seen in a plethora of findings, it can be seen in masses, could be seen in metastases, it can also be seen in AVMs, but it can also be seen in infarcts. All right, this is the um, next case. So, Hunter? Single form of view, uh, chest radiograph, and um, I see um, small diffuse bilateral opacities throughout, uh, almost like a, a miliary pattern. Uh, no, 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 no. To call this miliary pattern, you are starting off on the wrong foot. So um, uh, when I do my chest board review, this is not a board review, this is just collection of cases because it's got easy cases and harder cases. But when I do my chest board review, I will tell you that in the examination, they are looking for just 12 things to identify on a chest x-ray, 12 patterns, right? So one, you know, one is like bronchiectasis, the other one is mucoid impaction, the other one is reticular, the other one is nodular, one is reticular nodular, one is miliary. You just have to know those 12, and you don't need to know anything else. This is larger than miliary. This cannot be miliary. This cannot be miliary. This is much larger than millery. Millery is millet or pinpoint size. Okay. So let's start fresh. Okay, so I would say that uh, there are multiple um, different opacities of different sizes. Some of them are larger, some of them are very small uh, throughout bilateral lung fields diffusely. Um, then we could say that this is like possibly a, a nodular pattern or reticular nodular or a, okay. if it's not miliated, it's diffuse bilateral lung fields, opacity okay. bilateral. So this is how I would say it and correct me if I'm wrong. So first thing I would say that the lungs are hyperinflated. So if I were to count the ribs, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we're seeing the anterior end of the eighth rib. So they're mildly hyperinflated. Do you, would you agree? Um, it's mild flattening of the diaphragm. It's mild. All right. The second thing I would, if you're calling them multiple bilateral, bilaterally symmetric or bilateral opacities, that's not enough. Are these interstitial or are these airspace? We need to identify that right off. So would you say that are they more cotton wool appearing or are they more lines and crisscross? Um, How would you describe them? Would it be like cotton wool I opacities? This one, yeah, this one would definitely, this larger one here, and that would be more of an airspace, I think. Well, airspace. So I would also convince myself saying these are airspace opacities, less likely to be reticular opacities, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, once you've opacified, once you've identified that, do you identify any cysts? Because with multiple airspace opacities, if you see cysts, that's a game changer right away. The, you're going down a totally different path now. So I always squint and see, do I see anything that looks like cysts? And may, I don't know if it's projecting wrong, but this looks doesn't look like an airspace opacity. This doesn't look like an airspace opacity. Perhaps these don't look like airspace opacities. So they, I feel that there is some cystic component here. Oh, yeah, Would you yeah. agree? Yes. Can anybody, everybody see that? Okay. Now if I tell you that I see multiple bilateral airspace opacities in a patient with hyperinflation and some cystic lucencies as well. Just give me two or three differential diagnoses in that patient. So hyperinflated and uh, cystic pattern, you said? Cyst no, not cystic alone, cystic with airspace. Cystic with airspace. Um, anything cystic, so we're talking about um, infectious processes. Um, it could be... Um, Okay, let's, let's go down to the CT. Okay, um, so the 
first thing that uh, stands out to me is that it looks like there's uh, bronchiectasis, bilateral upper lobes, uh, extending also down into um, the lower lobes, but it's sparing the, um, the basal portion of the lung segments. Um, also, these peripheral um, ground glass, I guess not really ground glass, but there's, I guess, peripheral nodules with maybe some ground glass interspersed as well. Um, At this point, diagnosis. So did you say there were multiple cystic lesions? Did you call them cystic lesions? Um, I, I did not. Uh, or did you call them bronchiectasis? I think a lot of it, this looks, a lot of this looks like bronchiectasis. All this is bronchiectasis. You see the signet ring sign? This yes. is not your normal cell. There is a pulmonary artery adjacent to each of these. So the signet ring sign is right. positive. So those are all bronchioles. Yeah. All right. So, um, and these are those parenchymal opacities at the bases that we see. Okay. There could even be just mucoid impaction within those or some associated um, opacities in the airspace. I think this is um, vasculitis, like Wedgner's or uh, something along that line with the signet ring sign uh, and the bronchiectasis. Okay, so the Wedgner's patients, are they the ones that have um, sinusitis and issues to do with the um, head and neck? Or are the Wedgner's the patients who uh, have more conditions to do with the kidneys? <coughs> Anyone? I can't. Sinusitis. Sinusitis, right? So I'm going to give you the history that there is sinuses were clear. Patient demonstrates no sinus uh, uh, symptoms. All right, so we've identified bronchiectasis. We've identified hyperinflation. We've identified some airspace opacities. So hyperinflation, bronchiectasis, and some branching opacities, which were mucoid impaction, right? So this was all mucoid impaction right here, correct? Anybody wants to give a diagnosis right now? Cystic fibrosis. It's a young patient. If you see the index right, the shoulder, it's a young patient. So correct. This is cystic fibrosis. Well done, Sylvia. Differential diagnosis will include ABPA because of the mucoid impaction and ciliary dyskinesia, which is a big umbrella term, which includes the immortal cilia syndrome, and those patients will give history of infertility. Right? Aren't those more in the, in the basal segments there? What? The Correct. That's the differential diagnosis. I'm just saying yeah. that uh, mucoid impaction may be seen okay. in ciliary dyskinesia. That's the differential diagnosis for mucoid impaction mm -hmm. may be seen in ciliary dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was cystic fibrosis. So predominantly upper lobe bronchiectasis and mucus plugging, plugging in cystic fibrosis. Lungs are hyperinflated, predisposed to spontaneous pneumothorax. Can someone tell me one more condition in which, or two more conditions? in which you can have spontaneous pneumothoraces? And this can be a question. Who said lamb? Excellent. What else? One more. Peripheral interstitial emphysema. Pi, very good. And also catamenial pneumothorax. Huh? Subplural blebs. Subplural blebs, yeah, but I was asking for a disease entity. Okay? So what I was looking for basically was pi, I was looking for uh, LAM. Don't forget LAM. The presenting feature of LAM can be spontaneous pneumothorax. And whether the patient in real life presents like that or no, in the exam it always presents like that. Okay? Dr. Chana, can you go back to the signet ring sign and explain why <coughs> this patient had the signet ring sign? Yes. So what is a signet ring sign? The signet ring sign says that the pulmonary artery, a branch of the pulmonary artery, as well as branch of the um, bronchial tree, always travel together. Okay, that's that is what happens. Hold on, let me just fix this in a second. That's what tells you that these are dilated bronchioles and not cystic. Correct. Species. So what happens is that let's say we look at um, let's say we look at this particular cyst, okay? And you say, Dr. Chala, this is a cyst. So I say, is it any cyst or is it a special type of cyst? You'll say, oh, this is not just any cyst. It's actually a dilated bronchial tree. It's a dilated bronchiole. Why? Because it has an adjacent pulmonary artery next to it. 
So this combination of a donut with a ring, it's also sometimes called like a ring on, uh, like a ring that you wear on your, you know, this being the stone and this being the ring. This is the signet ring sign that just tells us that the pulmonary artery travels with the bronchiole. Again, let's look at this one. There's a dilated bronchiole with a pulmonary artery. So this is not just any cyst. I may not show you branching. I may not show you the origin of it coming from the uh, main bronchus then into the pr uh, first order, second order, third order branches. No. All I'm going to show you is this. And you have to look at this and hey, signal ring sign is positive. This is actually a bronchiole. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Other cysts that you would have in emphysema, for example, bullous emphysema, when you see the um, uh, adjacent pulmonary artery next to them, never, because they have nothing to do with the bronchial tree per se. They have to do with small airways disease. All right, we're done with that. Um, okay, this is just bronchiectasis. This is bronchial dilatation. The inner diameter of the bronchus will be more than the adjacent pulmonary artery. This is what, by definition, is bronchiectasis. Contour abnormalities, you can have signet ring, like I explained to you. You can have tram tracks, which were nothing but parallel lines. This is a tram track. This is a tram, this is a little lobulated actually. Tram tracks are absolutely divided, uh, parallel. When they are absolutely parallel, tram track, okay? When there are two parallel tracks, string of pearls is what I showed you, the little sigmoid or the little curling up. This is the string of pearls appearance. Could be because they are uh, showing lobulated margins. And then you have cluster of cysts when they are um, cystic bronchiectasis and they just look like multiple cysts in one line. Lack of tapering, more than two centimeters distal to the bifurcation. So that also tells us that could bronchiectasis. Visibility of the peripheral airways. What does that mean? In the peripheral, one centimeter of the pleural space. You normally don't see any airways, but here you see them within one centimeter of the costal pleura or touching the mediastinal pleura. That also we don't see. Bronchial wall thickening. Now what is bronchial wall thickening? Bronchial wall thickening is more than 0.5 times the diameter of the adjacent pulmonary artery. Could be fluid filled or mucus filled bronchi. This could demonstrate mosaic perfusion. Mosaic perfusion as you all know could have an etiology in the airway, could have the etiology in the vessels. So when it has an etiology in the airways, usually it is the bronchi that are um, mucus filled or you will get some tree in bud that you can see. Um, you have air trapping on expiratory scans and you have atelectasis, okay? So air trapping on expiratory scans, we do it routinely over here now. Patient breathes out, all the air cannot be um, expelled. There appears to be more trapping. So you compare the same section on inspiration, same section on expiration, you will see more lucency uh, if there is small airways disease. So what is mucoid impaction? Presence of mucus or fluid-filled bronchi, lobular branching structures, this is called finger in glove or Y-shaped configuration. Now mucoid impaction can be of two types, could be obstructive or non-obstructive. Let's go to the non-obstructive. The non-obstructive variety is ABPA, that is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, asthma and cystic fibrosis. And the obstructive type is benign neoplasms like bronchial hamartoma or a lipoma or malignant neoplasms like bronchogenic carcinoma, slow-growing carcinoid tumors or congenital bronchial atresia. Can anyone tell me that when you are shown a CT scan of congenital bronchial atresia, what is the classic imaging appearance? Does anyone remember? You see a, like a blind ending uh, bronchial, like near the mediastinum. It's like, it looks like a, a solid... Um, That's one half. The second half of the... You've said one half correct. There are two things. You see something else and you put the two... Of the very good. So congenital bronchial atresia, they will show you one finger in glove or one Y-shaped structure, one something branching, one, and with a large lucency around it. That's it. That's congenital bronchial uh, atresia. You want to see nothing else. You want to see nothing more. All right? So let's go. There. All right. We'll take this to uh, Bhavna. So when a case like this, let's say, comes to you from the ER or inpatient, we don't immediately start speaking, right? Oh, case has come, let's start talking. No, we let it simmer. We let it think it through for a minute, and then we talk. So do that in the examination. Do that when you look at your cases. Don't jump at them. Let it uh, simmer. So I see the finger, um, with the chest X-ray. Um, it's mostly in like the Um, 
Ignore. Mm -hmm. Ignore. What is the most worrisome finding on this radiograph? In which you might, you know, of course, patient, the patient has some multiple contusions, chest tubes, and um, you know, you even see something that could be a, a pneumathocele, that could be a pulmonary laceration. So you see all this jazz going on, but they already know because it's been in surgery, out of surgery, large hematoma. Is there something more worrisome than that? Bhavna only. Yes, Very good. What does that tell us? Like a pneumothorax, a pneumomediastinum. What did you say, pneumomediastinum? No, this is supine pneumothorax. It's pneumothorax, but I was a little worried about it's very loosened down here. Pneumothorax along with pneumomediastinum. Could be, but I'm trying to focus more only on this. And this could be, uh, while you're right, it's going very intimately in uh, contact along the left mediastinal border. It could have been that, but this is what my finding was. So anybody who could, who wants me to explain deep sulcus sign, anyone who could not identify this, because if you were not going to identify this in the exam, you are definitely coming back next year, right? So we cannot not identify this. So as you can see, you look at the lung bases, you see that this lower lobe is more loosened than the contralateral one, and this requires a phone call right away. Hyperloosened left lower lung, etched diaphragm, deep sulcus sign, etched mediastinum, no mediastinal displacement, pneumothorax. Let's go back. Etched means you can see that here if I give you, if I give Sylvia, if I give you a fine tip marker and I say, well, mark the diaphragm not even a point micrometer away. You can't do that because it gets blurry here, it gets blurry here, not here. You can take a pencil and etch it out. You can take a pencil and etch out the mediastinum all along, right? What sulcus is this in which the air has gone in, Bhavna? It's called the deep sulcus sign, right? Which sulcus are they talking about? Hmm? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Which sulcus? Correct. So the sign is called deep sulcus sign, right? If you're able to see the sulcus on the left side, but you're not able to see the sulcus on the right side, which sulcus are they talking about? Anyone? Which sulcus? Where is the air? Anterior, anterior. The anterior sulcus. Very good. You'll be asking you, could this be the posterior sulcus? No, this is the anterior sulcus. There is no anterior lateral sulcus. Anterior and posterior. All right. So same patient showing you the same thing. Of course, you know, uh, this. what sign is this, Abhavna, still with you? What radiographic feature is this? Crazy paling, very good. What do you see in crazy paling? You see ground glass opacity with underlying interlobular septal thickening, right? So one of the differential diagnoses if of crazy paling is pulmonary hemorrhage, and a patient with trauma can have pulmonary hemorrhage, and this crazy paling may well be seen there. All right. Okay, we've seen that, we've seen that. Why does it come in again? All right. Atifa, this is for you. Uh, hyperinflated lungs, cardiac is within normal limit, the trachea is midline, the aorta is calcified and um, tortuous. Um, <clears throat> no confluent earth space consolidation in both lungs. No, no, do you see it? Well, come again, repeat please. What did you say? I don't see any consolidation, but I see Hunter's head is What do you say? Blocking that corner. <laughs> um, so, this area is loosened, more loosened compared to the rest of the time. But that's normal. As you come down, the volume of the lungs goes larger, 
and the lower lobes are more loosened than the upper lobes, right? That is the whole thing when you do a lateral chest x-ray, right? Okay, the patient may, be, may have uh, previous gastric surgery. Any other abnormality in the chest? So this also is an exam case. It's like a spot on, like an antimony. You know, you have to, when you don't see anything else, you have to look for that. Okay, I think don't, no worries, you're only in first or second year, so that's okay. Um, Nor. Some triangular shaped opacity. Very good. So what is the diagnosis? It would be left lower lobe epiphysis. Excellent. And there is expansion, like uh, re expansion of the right, and there is the diastolic shape. Good. Give the thing back to Ati. Ati, do you see that triangular shaped shadow? Yes. This is the heart border, right? This is the heart border. Left heart border is formed by what? Left aortic arch, then left atrial appendage, and then left ventricle, right? Mm -hmm. Correct? So, what is this? What is this triangular shaped structure? It doesn't belong here. That's left lower lobe atelectasis, right? You see that? Left lower lobe atelectasis. Left lower lobe atelectasis. Retrocardiac opacity, silhouetting the descending aorta and the medial diaphragm. Very important. It's a very benign finding. Oh, it's just, it's just atelectasis. What's the big deal? Well, it is a big deal because that can sometimes be the only finding in lung cancer, in foreign body aspiration, mucus plugging, malpositioning of the endotracheal tube lymphadenopathy causing tracheal compression, carcinoid metastases, and endobronchial, um, endobronchial metastases, and pneumonia. Don't forget, car endobronchial carcinoid, I, in my 18, 19 years of practice, in real life, I have never seen. But on the exam, I have seen all the time. So it's a very hot favorite on the examination, endobronchial carcinoid. I know maybe it sounds cool, but it, it is very popular. Okay, in a bronchial lesion, you must say carcinoid. Whether you, you know, don't say mucus plug and all that, they're okay with that. But don't forget that. Nor's case. So here, so I just want you to identify a pattern. Nobody on this earth, even the one who has written the textbooks in um, radiology that we are looking, can diagnose this with, oh, this microorganism is no cardia. No, nobody can say that. But they can take you down a path. They can, you know, mi minimize it to three or four or five differentials. That is what is expected of you. So it's so a young patient, and I see here a predominantly upper lobes, uh, reticular nodular patterns, uh, some patchy opacities. I think I think some alveolar pattern. I think I see here a cyst, cyst here, cyst here as well. The heart is normal. I think there is some sparing of the left lower lung. Mainly in the upper lobes. Uh, I don't see any volume change in the lungs. I don't know. Um. Any other finding on the right diaphragm that you want to mention because it's a unique finding? On the right? Heavy diaphragm. What is this sign called? The juxtaphrenic peak, right? The juxtaphrenic peak tells you that when there is tenting of the diaphragm, peaking of the diaphragm like that, associated with atelectasis, whenever that happens to the lower lobe, that means the upper lobe is collapsed. Do you remember that? Juxtaphrenic peak? It can happen on the right or the left side. It just tells you that the lobe above that is collapsed, there's loss of volume. So it's trying to pull the diaphragm. <coughs> Good. So you said there were alveolar opacities there were ret uh, and reticular opacities, there were some cysts, there was upper lobe predominance, and I added that there was a juxtaphrenic peak, so there was loss of volume of the upper lobes. Anything else? There might be some bronchiectasis. Uh, I think that both highlands are kind of elevated. Correct, because of traction. There's traction. There is traction. That is the same thing that is said in the juxtaphrenic There's traction. Both highlands are elevated. Okay, very good. Keep going. In the upper lobes, I see this kind of uh, cavitary nodules, predominantly in the upper lobes, multiple ones. Uh, there's some mild, maybe plural effusions bilaterally. Okay, now stop. Now stop. Now, don't look at the CT. There is a patient who's got a cavitary lesion in the upper lobe with plural effusion. First diagnosis. TB. TB. This is TB. This is pulmonary tuberculosis. Whenever you're practicing and you see a cavitary lesion, 
even if I didn't see pleural effusion, because in post-primary TB, usually you may or may not have pleural effusion. It is primary TB that presents with pleural effusion. Anyway, so this is TB. Very good. What other findings do you see in TB? Cavitary lesions. Number two, something very, very unique to TB. Not very unique, but trained by opacities. Okay? Sarcoid, TB, granulomatous diseases. These called trained by. What does trained by opacity show us, uh, Noor? It would be like an infectious process that spreads through the small airways. Correct. So it is just the same thing. Finger in glove of the small airways. Trained bud is finger in glove. That is mucus impaction of the small airways. That small airways are plugged with something. Could be fluid, could be pus, could be blood, could be lymph. Who knows what? And then you can have mass-like consolidation in TB. Do you see this? Mass-like consolidation, cavitary lesions, trained blood opacities, pleural effusion, upper low predominance, pulmonary tuberculosis. Non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, fungal pneumonia, they remain differential diagnosis. Upper lung fibrosis, could be cystic fibrosis, sarcoid, all kind of pneumoconiosis, ankylosing spondylitis, TB, which includes granulomatous diseases, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and post-radiation change. And differential diagnosis of a cavitary upper lobe lesion could be, again, post-primary or reactivation TB, fungal infection, cavitary lung cancer, sarcoid, silicosis, Wegener's, and septic emboli. Should I read about post-primary TB? Okay. Imaging findings are enlarged, necrotic or rim-enhancing mediastinal lymph nodes. Consolidation is 100%, mass-like consolidation is a 100% invariable finding. Could be, this is not subsegmental size, this is lobular in size. It can involve the entire lobe. It's not your teeny tiny consolidation, subsegmental, lobar consolidation. Cavitation, 50%. Wall thickness is variable. Could be mostly thick versus thin. Shape may be irregular. Endobronchial spread nodules, centrilobular rosettes, poorly defined 2 to 10 millimeters in size, and tree in bud appearances. Let's see what rosettes they're talking about. Are they talking about these tiny nodules that are, se that are seen uh, end on? Are those the 2 to 10 millimeters nodules that you're seeing the tree in bud end on? CT, more specific, rim enhancing lymph nodes and more sensitive for active disease, signs of endobronchial spread, as you know, is tree in bud. Differential diagnosis, chronic fungal infection, ankylosing spondylitis, and PMF. What is PMF, Noor? Uh, progress, uh, so it's associated with silicosis. Very good. Tree in bud sign, centrilobular branching nodules that resemble a budding tree. Peripheral, small, well defined. <coughs> represents bronchiolar luminal impaction with mucus, mm. pus or fluid. So it's just a finger in glove with a small airways. Differential diagnosis, pulmonary infections, bacterial, mycobacterial, viral, parasitic, fungal, most commonly been described in patients with endobronchial spread of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So tree in bud was first described with TB. It is a characteristic but not pathognomic. Diffuse pan bronchiolitis, congenital cystic fibrosis, ABPA lymphoma, all these can cause tree and bud. So we have accomplished that. Next. Sylvia. Please, a little louder, Sylvia, please. Third anterior rib, correct? Yes. Third anterior end of the rib, expand side lesion. Okay, very good. Sylvia, what is your differential? Excellent that she saw the hemodialysis catheter and said that these could be brown tumors, right? All right, very good, Sylvia. Anything you want to add or subtract? Sylvia. 
same patient came in for a CT. This was a topogram, expand cellular ablation, fibrous dysplasia, ABC, metastasis, multiple myeloma, and evening sarcoma. Very good. This is yet another patient. Sylvia, it's yours. It's a companion case. It may not be the same case. Are these lesions in the chest wall or are these lesions within the lung? Um, you have to pick one. In the lung? Very good. So let's go back to that case. Why did you say that this was not in the lung, Sylvia? Because I see that it's in, yes, in cortical, it has cortex. The first, the first button, the one has a green bar on it. Okay. This is a, like cortical bone. Okay. This. <laughs> so good. One that you could see that it was continuing with the rib. Number two, look at the margins of this. The margins appear very sharp. It looks like someone has taken a white marker and made those out, right? That is very typical with pleural-based lesions or chest wall lesions that they appear this bright. But this one, there's no such phenomenon that I don't see anything that this is darker, this is lighter. These were all intrapulmonary lesions. Next case, Tope. Tope, you are going to participate, right? Yes, no. Is this exclusively interstitial tope? What is it? Is it only interstitial? Um, Remember one thing, that if there is only interstitial opacities, the density of the lung should not change, of the underlying lung. You should just see white lines through a normal back, black background. But that's not the case here, right tope? Black, 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 like Tom Gates. Black, 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 white. Black, 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 black white. Right? Even the lung behind it is white or gray, light gray, correct? Yes. So this cannot exclusively be um, interstitial because then you would see black with white lines, you know, just like a, a ruled paper. But that's not the case. So there definitely is an element of pulmonary or alveolar change. Okay, loss of volume, atelectasis, uh, linear um, opacities, loss and some change in density. All right, so you want to go with the bilateral lower lobe atelectasis? Uh, okay. All right, anything else? If you can identify th this structure. The minor fissure, so there's expansion of the upper lobe. There's total knocking out of the lower lobe right here. So ground glass opacity. Next, sparing the periphery. Any diagnosis right now? Because you're using buzzwords, right? Sparing the periphery is a buzzword. I mean, you can, 
When I say a buzzword is one that indicates only one thing or one or two things, right? Okay. Hmm? No, 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 Tope. UIP is totally different. UIP, no ground glass opacities or very little. Honeycombing, loss of volume, basilar predominance, subfloral uh, cystic change. No, not at all. Pass the back to Hunter. Ground, so the, the findings are ground glass opacities, okay. bilateral, some cystic spaces, odd, one or two, all cystic spaces, some subfloral sparing diagnosis. Okay, NSIP type pattern, I will agree. Yeah. Any more specific you'd like to be? Um, Let's review the findings again. You still have time. So you have some volume loss that we said. There was basilar um, uh, airspace disease. Peribronchial consolidation with ground glass opacities. They said that the, the mild dilatation here of the bronchi, as you can see, tram track sign. Mild, I, I did not appreciate this. Some secondary pulmonary lobules are highlighted by perilobular curvilinear opacities. It's a very um, HRCT type finding. I didn't really appreciate it. COP, chronic aspiration, and BAC. What is the new name of BAC? What is BAC? Bronchalveolar carcinoma. What is the new name? So, bronchalveolar carcinoma no longer used. I think there are a bunch of idle men, you know, who are retired. They just few years think, well, let's just change names, you know, of things. You don't have nothing better to do. So let's just start changing names of existing uh, pathologies. So bronchialveolar carcinoma was the old name. Pulmonary adenocarcinoma is the new name. So this could be CO. Whenever you see bilateral diffuse ground glass opacities, few cystic lesions, some tram track, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, chronic aspiration, and bronchialveolar carcinoma. On COP, don't we normally see more of like a halo or? Uh, That's the atoll sign you're talking about. Yeah. The atoll sign is it's ready. Rever it's reverse. It's reverse. Atoll sign is what talking about. Atoll sign is classic feature of COP. What is atoll sign, Bhavna? Surrounded by consolidation. Correct? Lucency surrounded by consolidation. Atoll is like an island, right? So atoll sign. If they show you that, they're literally giving you the answer, right? It, it, when seen, so bilateral, peripheral, peribronchovascular ground glass opacities affect the lower lobes more than the upper lobes, may have migratory pattern. So this is a differential diagnosis of fleeting pulmonary opacities. Tofe, more, two more differential diagnoses for fleeting pulmonary opacities. In 4 of 4 p.m. it's like this, 10 p.m. it's like that, they keep changing. Hmm? I'm not sure. What else? Anybody else? Very good. And? Pulmonary hemorrhage. No. Huh? No. No. Eosinophilic pneumonia. Okay. Eosinophilic pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and cough, fleeting opacities. Sometimes pleural effusion also can be included in that depending upon um, patient position. Small nodules, bronchial wall thickening may spare the subpleural space. So when um, Tope said that, this, this combination of ground glass opacities with sparing of subpleural space is really not seen in anything else. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right there, COP should have been in our differential, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. All right, who's next? Uh, John. I have a question, Dr. Chad. Yes. But so as far as like NSIP, that they have a similar look yes, as well. This is NSIP pattern. Yes, this is NSIP pattern. Yes, this is NSIP pattern. This is COP is an NSIP pattern. Okay, okay. This is NSIP pattern. All right, uh, uh, John. Let's see. This is the line. Go to the top left side. It's kind of strange. Torches. 
Jim's aorta. What did you say about the line? It's coming over the contralateral side, like. So is that normal? No. It's either in. What? What? Which vessel um, is the line originally placed in? Looks like it was originally placed in the right IJ. Wrong. Subclavian. So, so you said IJ. When very easy, there's no uh, rocket science here. If the initial segment, this is where the, it is punctured into the skin, right? That's. This is a loosely hanging part outside the patient's body. This is the site of puncture. If the original aspect is horizontal, it is subclavian. If the original segment is vertical, it is IJ. So this is placed by the right subclavian vein. Okay. Then what happened to it? Then it should have just gone down normally into the right brachiocephalic, then SVC, right atrium, right ventricle, IVC, right? That's it. So what is this crossing over? What's going on? So either they've got some sort of heterotaxia or it's in the aorta or in the arterial system. Okay. All right. What is the one thing that's telling you that probably it's not in the aorta uh, on the x-ray? If it's in the aorta, I mean, it's a traumatic uh, insertion, right? I mean, they were struggling back and forth, you know, um, you know overzealous uh, physicians trying to put it in. Well, I thought maybe they just missed the subclavian artery for the vein. So could they be in the hemiazygous? Okay, let's backtrack. So malposition, central venous catheter, right? The diagnosis is malposition, central venous catheter. Okay. So what is, so you're on call, uh, okay, I'm your uh, night attending, and uh, this goes down this wrong airway, and they're thinking, oh my God, could this be in the aorta? So I look at it, I said, no, there is no mediastinal widening. There is no, I don't think the aorta has been punctured because there have to be a pneumo, I mean a hemomediastinum if their aorta has been punctured like this. But it looks sharp and clean. But we still don't know whether it's in the artery or the vein. What are you going to do? You look at it with ultrasound, you no. CT, you can draw blood back. Good. Immediately draw 2 cc of blood, run the arterial blood gas on it. If the arterial blood gas is above 97%, it's in the artery. If it's below 93%, it's in the vein. So very simple, right? Now, this came back that it's venous. The arterial blood gas showed that this is in the vein. Now what do you do? What is your differential diagnosis on the x-ray? You have to say something. Always risk of like some sort of superior vena cava obstruction. So maybe in a collateral channel, is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, collateral channel, all right. But as an examiner, I will tell you that a patient didn't have a puffy face or a puffy neck or a puffy chest wall veins. It didn't seem like the SVC was obstructed. All right. So, okay. It's in a vein, but on the opposite side. Could be in a collateral. Could it be in anything else? It's drawing blood just fine. So this is the leftward inferior course of a central line, correct? That's what's going on. Persistent left SVC is your first diagnosis if this is uh, still drawing blood and venous blood, you have confirmed that, represents persistence of the left common cardinal vein, courses along the left side of the mediastinum and then drains directly into the coronary sinus, majority associated with absent left brachiocephalic vein, usually associated with normal or decreased size of the right-sided normal SVC. Minority associated with absent right SVC. Other veins that this could be in, this could be a vertical vein. A vertical vein is not normal uh, unless it is associated with partial anomalous pulmonary uh, venous connection from the left upper lobe. There is no enlargement of the coronary sinus, normal to enlarge left brachiocephalic vein and right SVC. And the third it could be in is the enlarged left superior intercostal vein. Who can tell me what does a left superior intercostal vein look like on a chest x-ray? I will take that person for uh, coffee. It has got a very classic appearance on chest x-ray and this is open to the house. I can't hear. 
You see that on chest X-rays and say, hey, this is a left superior intercostal vein. Anyone? I cannot hear. Oh. Did you say something, Tope or Sylvia? Huh? What did you say, Ati? Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm, never mind. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> maybe like that. Heroid, mirror image of um, azygous vein on the left. I, I couldn't hear you, but you said something to do with the azygous vein on the left? I said a mirror image of azygous vein on the left. This is it. What did uh, Topi say? Mirror image of uh, azygous vein on the left. Maybe azygous fissure. Yeah, so what you see is very classic appearance. You will see a small nipple. Why are you not confident, Ati? You missed coffee now with me. So now you'll wait till the next question. Yeah, it's a nipple sign. It's classic. You will see a small teeth like projection or a nipple sitting on the aorta. So we would see that, you know, it probably, um, in the past when, you know, when I did my residency, we, uh, we did it when the x-rays were on, on x-rays. I mean, they were on film. So we would save these extras or duplicate them in, in teaching files. And then, you know, we had this case over here. Somebody would say, oh, is it aneurysm or Sudan? No, 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 no. This is left superior intercostal vein. Ati, did, you, did she, Ati say yeah, uh, nipple sign? Ati, why didn't you say loudly? She was advised to say She, she didn't want to repeat it. She said it once. Yeah, she did. I, I got a question, Dr. Chata. Yes. So whenever I was seeing this, I was thinking like he was like the uh, azygous so in one of the azygous. How would that look different? Correct. So, um, on the azygous vein, if this is on the azygous vein, the most important view is the lateral view. On the lateral view, it will come down and have a J-shaped appearance. It's called the hook sign. If a vein, if a catheter enters the azygous vein, it becomes like a candy cane. So remember, it's a mnemonic. Azygous vein, candy cane. It's like a sing song. Here, there is no J sign. If it is in the azygous aperture, it looks J. Okay? So actually, when I was doing medical, I had an um, x ray artery and an x ray. The central line will come from here and then like turns this way. So it was just a single frontal chest. Um, so if it is turning so that way, it looks. It to get a lateral and it would just go backward. It was like in the azygous. Yeah, it will go back. So azygous origin, if you see on this plane, uh, on the CT, if you remember, and I will show you, it's, let's, let's see. Where is the azygous vein? The azygous vein will come like this, correct? It's posterior, right? What's, this is the superior vena cava, the azygous is posterior, correct? That is why on the x-ray, the azygous will be posterior. The catheter will tip will be like a J, like a hook towards the spine, okay? So leftward, this, um, what am I doing? Leftward inferior course of a central line only has three differential diagnoses. Most common is persistent left SVC. Number two, vertical vein, but that is not seen with, without other form, other features of you know partial anomalous form um, communication. And then the enlarged left superficial intercostal vein, which is a deep sign or a nipple sign sitting on the aortic arch. All right, whose case was this? John. John, keep going. This is the this is the right SVC. This is the left SVC. Correct? They both are vertical like that, and they give a box-shaped appearance around the uh, aorta. So this is the left side SVC. This is the right side SVC, and the catheter was traversing the left side SVC. Okay, and they say the left side SVC drains directly into the coronary sinus. Am I correct? What is this structure? This is the coronary sinus. Okay. Correct. Next, who's next? 
Well, there's this. So, further view of the chest x-ray, um, you can see that So what did you say? Diffuse, diffuse airspace opacity. Is that what you said? No, interstitial more like reticular opacities. Okay, more reticular opacities with some sparing of the lung base. Anything else? Bilateral airspace disease. I explained to you in, no, in uh, Tope's case that if the density of the lung is changing, definitely alveoli are involved. Let's go back. If the lung is transitioning from normal to abnormal, it's becoming like ground glass density. Though ground glass is a term to be used on CT and not on X-ray, but if we use it loosely here and we say that these look ground glass, this is definitely alveolar. Next, second thing that you missed out, that here, there looks like that there's coalescing. There's coming together of an opacity. It looks like large opacity here. This is definitely airspace because the density of the lung changed. Is there any question? These three, I mean, they're too thick to be a reticular. They're too thick to be reticular. We will see reticular coming up in the next few cases. But this is only, this is, if I, somebody showed me, this is, could this be pulmonary edema? I said, yeah, this could be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Does the patient have any neuro, um, neurotrauma or things like that? Because very bat wing, very um, ground glass, very alveolar. When you say non-cardiogenic just because the heart's not enlarged? Yes, there is no, chance, no signs of right heart failure. So differential diagnosis in bilateral airspace opacity depends upon acute versus chronic, could be bud, blood, pus, fluid, or cell. This is all alveolar. What are the contents of the alveolus? This was actually a patient with what pattern? Crazy paving pattern. So what I would do when I was taking my boards, that when I saw that, oh, this is crazy paving, then I would go back and then look at this x-ray and say that next time when I see it, whether in the exam or in real life, mostly in the exam, will I be able to call this crazy paving? This confirms to you that there is nothing, there may be mild interlobular septal thickening and crazy paving, but all this is ground glass. Differential diagnosis of crazy paving, please. That's PCP, no? What did you say? Did you want to say alveolar proteinosis? <coughs> PCP is what? That's an old name for, again, a few people had nothing to do, retired. They said, okay, let's change the name now of PCP. <laughs> After we changed bronchial adenocarcinoma, now let's change some more names. So what is this? Pulmonary? Pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Okay. They say that pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is not a very common disease, but, we, but whenever we see crazy paving, that's the first thing out of our mouth. It should not be the first thing out of our mouth because it's a very rare disease. Findings crazy paving. If the presentation is chronic, then pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, non-specific interstitial pneumonia. Again, like Hunter said, the, the hallmark of UIP or um, the first pattern, UIP, is honeycombing. The hallmark of NSIP is ground glass. So this is NSIP pattern, like COP was NSIP pattern. If there is subacute presentation, Hunter, pay attention, cop. In the immunocompromise, it could be pneumocystis gyrovesci pneumonia, which is a new name for PCP. In the ICU patient, diffuse alveolar damage, which is a new name for ARDS. So there are a lot of people who are idle. Pulmonary edema, miscellaneous bronchialveolar carcinoma, the new name of which is pulmonary adenocarcinoma, and pulmonary hemorrhage. I'm waiting for a new name for that. <laughs> All right. So, was it looking like cotton 
Yeah, it cotton. No, it wasn't looking like cotton wool appearance. Cotton wool appearance is more when it is patchy consolidation. Whenever you see cotton wool appearance on X-ray, on CT it will turn out to be nodular consolidation, patchy consolidation. When you see bat wing or diffuse ground glass on X-ray, it turns out to be that, like ground glass on CT. Okay, like this could have been a pulmonary edema also. I answer the last question. Uh, who will it go to? Ati? Ati, you can redeem your cup of coffee here also. Okay? <laughs> but the diagnosis so has to come out. So patient presented with acute chest pain. Is it um, like pneumothorax? It was a pneumothorax, okay. Filling defect way? It's just a It's just a different part, sorry. So you have identified a pneumothorax, have you identified anything else? You said pleural effusion bilateral? Um, right on the first image, left on the second image? Bilateral, right greater than left. Okay. Um, anything else that looks abnormal? Let me look at this. Let's look at this cyst over here. Does it have a pulmonary artery associated with it? No. Do we see any more cysts, especially here? Yeah, I see like a lot of central, central valvular cystic. Now do you see? Now what is the diagnosis? Open to the house. Lamb. Lamb. We all get coffee. We all get coffee. Yeah, we all get coffee. We just spoke about that. Young patient presented with acute chest pain. Cyst and pneumothorax. Cannot be anything else but lamb. What is lamb? What is this? So, what is lamb associated with? Very good. So, we bilateral A angiomyolipoma in a patient with lamb. The whole patient with the diagnosis is a syndromic, which is tuberous sclerosis. Yeah, the answers you knew you were not, you were not telling. The answers you didn't know you were telling. Okay, we'll just finish this and then we'll go. <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen more often too as you get through, it's okay. I have see, that's the first Young one. females, tuberous sclerosis association, that is renal angiomyolipoma. Sometimes they'll show you chest, I mean abdomen CT, sometimes they'll show you brain CT, right following this, right? Subapendimal tubers. Complications, spontaneous pneumothorax, chylus effusions. If you would have said that, I got coffee with brownie. Chylus effusions, because these patients have chylus effusions. I'm and, right, huh? <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> and lung transplant is the only option. We will continue next time.